few things to talk about. Um, I do want to remind you that for this next up upcoming lab, I think it's lab six, um, the only thing that's due is the design. So you don't need to have the code written and working, just the design. What do I mean by design? I mean a class diagram. And we sort of went over an example of a class diagram filled out with the methods. And the more you think through the methods and the more that you, um, how do I want to say this, the more you have a clear idea of what the methods are supposed to do, um, the better you're going to be. And we're going to talk a bit about methods today. We're going to talk, we're going to look at, the, revisit the class diagram and talk about it and so on. Um, I am um, planning on making the exam, how should we work this? It's going to be online, okay? Um, I will make it available, if I made it available Wednesday after class and gave, it, gave you until Monday, would that be sufficient for most people? All right. I will do that then, and if there's a special case, you can let me know. Uh, there is no new lab this week. Um, and the lab that is due again, when, or is it due next week, the lab? No, I think there's a lab due this week, but it's a design. So um, you know, of course, the next step is going to be to program it, but you can worry about that uh, after the midterm. So this is sort of a good catch-up period. Um, I'll make the, the, the midterm due um, uh, available after the class on Wednesday, and it will be due before the class on Monday. All right. Let's take a look at where we left off, because what I like to do is, is fill in the, um, fill in the um, um, test plan, or uh, uh, fill in the, uh, the class uh, diagram, and maybe spend a little bit of time talking about the test plan as well. So let me pull that up. All right, this is a video. This is what we did with pizza for the chaining of constructors. All right, we can redraw it. That'll be good because we can review this. Um, the problem, if you remember, was along these lines. A library has patrons that check out a variety of material, books, new release books, DVD, new release DVDs, Patrons have a name, e email address, all books have an ID, title, author, date checked out, the patron is, uh, that has it checked out. All DVDs have an ID, a title, a rating, date checked out, and also the patron that has it checked out. Let me edit that. All library materials should be able to say if it's checked out, what the due date is, who has it checked out, or if it's checked out, and a fine based on uh, the date return. Patrons should be able to tell this. Patrons should be able to check out an item, should return true or false, check an item back in. All right, and then we had that schedule for the um, how long it was um, due how long they, they had to check out uh, along with the time. What do we decide upon as far as a class diagram goes? If I remember right, we had, we sort of came up with two options for a class diagram.
Well, what does a class diagram show again? Well, it shows classes. What's important to show in a class diagram? Attributes. That's true. What else is important to show? Methods. That's true. What else is important to show? Exactly, the relationships between the classes. Specifically, um, the sort of inheritance relationships. What are subclasses, what are superclasses, and so on. So, we sort of came up with two options for this. Does anyone recall what those two options were? Does anyone re recall what the option related to? Yes. Right. Exactly. Um, the 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 variance between the two uh, structures that we talked about related to whether there should be a separate class for a new book and a new DVD, or whether there should be logic in the new book and new DVD that would allow you to, um, to, to handle either one of them with one class. So, let's do the simpler one first, where there is, no, there is no separate class. And by simpler, I simply mean with fewer classes. So let's do the fewer class option first. And again, I don't care which way you go. Uh, I don't think it really matters that much, but we can, we can take a look at it. Um, what were the classes in that one? Okay, there were books. What else? Actually, DVDs? Yeah. Did these have a parent class? Yeah, library materials. All right. And finally, the other class we had was patrons. And was there an inheritance relationship between patrons and anything else on this diagram? All right, because a patron isn't a library material. You don't check out a, a fellow library patron. All right, there is a relationship though between patrons and library materials, in that a patron checks out library materials. That was the less class version, the fewer classes, I should say. Uh, version because we only have um, four classes here. The other version would simply have inherited from this a new book and a new DVD. All right. Keep in mind, we're simply doing the functionality for this. We're designing the functionality. We're not worried about, like, for example, persistent storage, like where we're going to store these guys, whether they'll be stored in a database or how they're going to be stored. All right? But option two would be to have those other classes. What would the difference between option one and option two be? If we took option one with new books, with a new book class, Let's just look at books, because DVD is going to be the same. All right? If we took option one and only had a book class and did not have new book class, what would we need to have to differentiate between the two? Yes? Okay. Well, there, there'd be some kind of book. There'd be some kind of attribute that would say this book is new. So this book is not new. What methods would be affected? The fines, the calculate the due date, the things that related to the due date. Because the only difference between these two um, things 
is um, the only difference between these is, is uh, how long you have the book for. So when the due date is. So really, probably the only difference you'd have is you would have to have also logic. You have the way of differentiating a new book from a not new book. And then you'd need logic in the calculate due date method uh, to, to uh, differentiate between the two and use the one method in calculating that. And also in calculating what the fine would be, because there's a different fine depending on if it's a new book or that. So that's where, that's the two places you need that. Now what if we implemented them as, um, not as, um, not, or what if we did implement rather a new book subclass of book? We wouldn't really need the attribute, right? Because you'd, you would, the only difference would be how you would calculate the amount of the fine and the due date. And how would we implement that? How do we get a different way of calculating something in a subclass as opposed to its superclass? would override the method. In other words, there would be a method to calculate due date on book, and we would override that method for new book to use a different equation, all right, or different calculation. Just like we would override the method for calculating the fine for new book to use the new formula for calculating the fine. So, one involves having an attribute and changing the uh, changing the, the calculate functions to be aware of that attribute. The other simply involves overriding um, um, the methods. I'll allow you to do either one. So I won't take off if you take either approach on this one. You can make an argument for either of these two approaches. I would lean towards doing the inheritance one simply because that really makes things clean. I don't have to have a messy other attribute. I simply override the methods that I need to and that will give me a framework if I would ever need to do something else differently for a new book. And that would also give me a framework if there was another kind of book I needed to account for, like an oversized book or an interlibrary loan book or something along those lines, where there was another type of subclass of book, I would then be in a position to handle that. If I were to put attributes in the book class and simply make my calculations take those attributes into account, I'm liable to have a very complex calculation for the due date. If it's this kind of book and it's that kind of book or it's that kind of book, calculate it this way. So therefore, it's sort of, in my mind, it, may, it simplifies it by simply overriding the, the methods for that. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write... Um, I'm going to we're going to we're going to work on this version of the design with the two different subclasses. And I'm going to write these classes down on this page. And we're going to go through and we're going to look at the requirements and we're going to de decide what attributes and methods each of these need. All right? So patrons, library materials, book, DVD, and then new book and new DVD. So let's look at these requirements because as we analyze the requirements, the stuff that we're going to be seeing is we're going to be seeing classes that we need, we're going to be seeing attributes, and we're going to be seeing methods. And it's important for us to know what goes what and what logically fits where. So a library has patrons that check out the variety of materials. Well. From that, we come up with these four or five classes. Actually, we come up with a sixth class because all of these four classes have something in common. 
So we've come up with this design where there uh, are six classes. All right. Patrons have names and email address. What does that imply? Are those attributes or are those methods? Are those classes? Those are attributes. So, under patrons, for their attributes, we would have name and email address. Yes, the format that we discussed last time, and the format, by format do you mean what type of file, or what the file should look like? Um, not something proprietary. Okay, that's not really a good answer, right? Uh, a PDF would be great, or a Microsoft Word document would be great. Um, a Visio document, depending on where I grade it, I might have, to have Visio installed. All right. Um, I'm almost positive that Visio has the option to export to a PDF or to a Word document, so um, I would do one of those. If you absolutely can't do anything else, um, that's fine. Y you know, you can even hand write and hand draw these if you want, and just take a picture of it or take a picture and insert it into a PDF or whatever. I'm more concerned about content rather than um, um, the appearance. Yes. Okay. All right. Sure. And that's fine too. Yeah, that, that's fine too. Okay. All books have IDs, authors, have IDs, titles, authors, they checked out, and the patron that has it checked out. What do those sound like to you? Those sound like attributes, all right? And where should they belong, given this diagram? Do we want to even answer that question now, or do we want to read a little bit longer? I, pardon me? Probably read a little bit longer. Why did I say that? Because I tell no one wants to talk today, and, and everyone wants to delay it as far as possible. What did I, why did I really say that? Exactly. There could be duplicate attributes. In fact, when we, when we scroll down just a little bit more, we see that all DVDs have an ID, a title, a rating, a date checked out, and patron that has it checked out. Okay. So what is the implication of those two things? Where do I put what? Okay, the common attributes between book and materials are going to be in the library material. In the library materials, or between book and DVDs are going to be in the library materials. The different ones are going to be in the respective book and DVD. And the way I did this, let's see. All books have IDs, all DVDs have IDs. So, that's one for library material. All DVDs have titles, all books have titles. Another one for library materials. A book has an author, a DVD has a rating. They both have a checked out. Um, uh, date, and they both have the patron that checked it out. So, where would author go then? Under book. Where would rating go? Under DVD. What about the date checked out? Where would that go? Under library materials? What about patron that checked it out? Also, under library. What data type would this patron be? 
Is it an integer? Is it a string? Is it a Boolean? Is it what? Okay, we have a vote for string. Make it a number. You're not going to add it, but if we're talking about like, especially if we're talking about connecting this to a database or something, numbers are typically stored more efficiently than strings are. Okay. What if I said the answer is none of those things that I mentioned? <laughs> what would it be then? That, that you mentioned rather. All right. What would it be then? What contains all the information I have of a patron? Exactly. What did, did you give an I heard you say you're thinking in database terms, and I would agree. You're definitely thinking in database terms. What contains all the information about a given patron? The patron class. So therefore, this attribute, the patron that checked out this library material, is going to be of type patron. OK. Because then, let's say we have a book that someone is interested in. And I look up that book and I see it was due a week ago. And someone else has it on hold, let's say. Someone else reserved it. So I want to contact the patron. All right? I want the ability to get everything about that patron. I want to look at that book and say, all right, who's the patron? Maybe what their email address is what their phone number is, what their address is, so I can send the cops to their house, or whatever, the library police, or whatever. I want any place that I need a patron, I want everything about that patron. Because I might write my application to do a bunch of different things. I could create an automated phone call that says, you have overdue library materials. I could send automated emails out saying, you have something that was due last week, or whatever. The point is, is I don't know how I want to use that patron necessarily, but I know that that is a little patron component. Who checked it out? A patron did. Therefore, I want a patron object as that attribute. All right? So this is going to be a patron object, the patron that checked out the library materials. All right? So I'm going to plug in a patron there. So if, if someone checks it out, I'm going to plug in that particular library materials class. I'm going to plug in the patron class of the, or object of the person that checked it out. All right. All library materials should be able to return this. Oops. Due date, if overdue, who has checked out, if checked out, and a fine based on return date. What do those sound like to you? Those sound like methods. So, there's almost like a hint written here. All library materials. Therefore, where would these methods live? Library materials. So there'll be a get due date. There'll be is overdue. There'll be get patron that checked out. And there will be get fine. All right. Patron should be able to tell how many items a patron has checked out, if it has any overdue items, and how many overdue items. All right. What do those sound like? Those all sound like methods. So. 
kind of draw this line here. A patron will have get how many? Has overdue. Get how many? Overdue. Okay. A patron should be able to check out an item and check an item back in. What do those sound like? Sound like methods. All right, it's a process. Again, how do you know if something's a method or an attribute? Well, does it sound more like some sort of process or calculation? Or does it sound more like just a value? Like name? Well, name's just a value. I can't calculate someone's name. All right. Birth date. Is birth date an attribute or a method? Attribute. What about age? Probably a method, right? Probably a method. I would rather have it a method because your age always changes, right? Your birth date never changes. So if I store a birth date, I can calculate the age, right? So after my next birthday, I'd be one more year older and, and so on down the line, all right? So something that, has, something that seems to be simply a value is going to be an attribute. Something where there's some sort of calculation or process involved is going to be a method. And checking out an item, that sounds like a process, right? You know, it's not simply a value. You go through a process. You know, think manually of what they do. Or think like what they would have done in the old days. You know, you would sign the card, all right? What am I saying? Probably none of you have ever checked a book out of the library this way. But you would sign the card. You'd give it to the clerk. The clerk would take it and put it in some file somewhere. All right, give you a due date saying when it's due. It was a process that happened. All right, so check out an item and check in an item would both be methods. Now, the last thing is to implement this table. Now, how would you implement that table? We've briefly touched on this already. Override. Would override methods. Right. Well, first of all, I don't, I don't have written that we do have those methods already in book and DVD. So I would go and I would put a get due date and a get fine in book and DVD and then I, I would override them in here. Well, which one is different? Wh which one changes? Which one? They both, they both change, right? Because um, the fine for a new DVD is $5 plus a dollar a day. The fine for a regular DVD is a dollar a day. The checkout period is three days for new DVD and seven days for that. So, right, they're both different for new materials versus you, um, older materials. So, therefore, you need to override them both. If, for example, the fine for everything was a dollar a day, and the only thing that, that varied is how long you could keep the material, then yeah, then you might be able to, to, to override one and not the other. But here, both the fine, and really there's a different way even of calculating the fine, right? Um, with, uh, with a uh, new DVD and new book, there's five dollars, or there's five and one dollar right off the bat that you're charged, and then you're charged an increment based on how long that you've had it. Um, out.
All right. I think we, we, we touched on this at the very end of class on whenever our last class was, last Wednesday. We said that library materials are a special kind of class. Do we recall what kind of class I said those were? They're an abstract class. What does an abstract class mean? What does it mean to say that something is an abstract class? We can define it in like logical terms, just like everyday conversation terms, or we can define it in technical programming terms. So we'll do both. All right. First, the, the more intuitive approach. When we say something is an abstract cla class, it means that there's no real instances in the real world that are only members of that class and not members of one of, it, one of its subclasses. For example, our hypothetical library that we're talking about in this example has DVDs and books in it, right? That's what it has. That's all it has in this particular example. It has DVDs and it has books, all right? If you are checking out something, you are checking out a DVD or you are checking out a book. There is no such thing as um, I'm checking out some kind of vague library material that isn't a DVD or a book. All right? If there was, then we would have a class for it because it would probably have its own um, rules for due date and fine. It would be like having a pet class if you're a pet store. All right? Um, maybe in your pet store, you run a pet store, let's say, and, and you answer questions about pets. Like, what do you feed? What, what, what is good food for my pet? And there might be a method to calculate it, right? And so for a bunny, it would be lettuce and carrots and hay. For a dog, it would be dog food. For a cat, it would be fish, cat food. For a snake, it would be bugs and rodents and gross stuff like that, right? But there's always, you, no one only has a pet, all right? No one has a pet that doesn't belong to one of the subcategories of pet. So if you called into that store and say, what should I feed my pet? And they say, well, what kind of pet is it? You're not going to say, it's merely a pet. Was well, it a dog or a cat or a horse or a rabbit? Nope. It's only a pet. That doesn't make sense. People don't only have pets. They have, in the real world, at one of the subclasses of pets. So what's running around your living room is a lizard or a, a horse. I hope not love it running around your living room, but uh, is a horse or a dog or a cat or whatever. Yes, it is also a pet, but the only things that really exist in the real world are subclasses of pet. So we use pet because we can define some certain characteristics of pet that all pets share. But nothing is merely a pet. Just like in our library case, nothing is merely a library material. It's either a book or it's a DVD. And again, we could extend that to have CDs and books on tape and, and magazines and, and, and Blu-ray or whatever, all right? But we would still be adding subclasses and no one would ever be merely checking out library materials. So for that reason, library materials are an abstract um, class. Now, get due date and get fine are also kind of special. All right? 
We know that every library material that we have, every kind of library material we have, we have to be able to calculate its due date. And we have to be able to calculate the fine for it. All right? However, what is the default rule for calculating the fine or the due date for a piece of library material? Or let me rephrase the question. Is there a default rule for calculating the fine or the um, due date for library material? No. Every library material, every subclass of library material has its own rule. So there is no default. Just like going back to our pet store example, is there a default kind of food for pets? No. There's not one food that works for every single pet. All right? So therefore, there's no default to say, well, this is a default, and then I'm going to override it for these specific um, subclasses. These, then, are abstract methods. And what's an abstract method? An abstract method, you simply define the signature of the function. What do I mean by signature of the function? I mean the name of the function, the, the arguments for that function, and the return value for that function. So in the case of get fine, the argument or the signature probably would be get fine, the date that was returned, and it's probably going to return a double. It's going to return how much money is due. For calculate due date, is simply going to, there won't be any arguments that will simply return a date. In other words, the date that it was due. But that's all we know. We know that's how we're going to calculate it for all these different things. But we can't put any programming logic in there for that. And therefore, we have to define those methods as abstract methods. Because there is no default way of calculating the due date or the fine for a generic library material. Now what does it mean when we create an abstract class and an abstract method? I sort of talked about the theoretical reason for it. Is when there's no such thing as like a default or there's no such thing as a generic there's always going to be something more specific in the real world. In the case of a class, if it's an abstract class, I cannot do this. I cannot do that. Nope. Because in the real world, there's no such thing as something that is merely some library material. It's always something more specific. It's always a book or a DVD. I could do this. if I wanted to, all right? And that would be valid, because a book is a concrete object. If you don't specify abstract, it's a concrete object. In other words, there really are these things running around in the world, all right? So maybe pet would be an abstract class. Maybe dog would be a concrete class. And then maybe underneath dog, you could have German Shepherd and, and Doberman, uh, Dobermans and, and Pugs and all those things. All right? Because someone may just have a dog. You know? You got a mutt, right? What kind of dog you have? I don't know. It's a dog, right? So that's valid. But it's not valid to say, well, it's, you know, it's merely a pet. 
It's nothing more specific than a pet. Well, that's a little too generic, all right? You mean you can't tell me that it's a bird or a dog or a cat? Nope, it's just a pet. You know, what is it then, you know? So with an abstract class, I cannot do this. To use the verbiage that we used last time, this is called instantiating an object. In other words, making an object. So I cannot have library material objects in my heap. I have to create concrete objects. Now, part two of this equation is, is when I have an abstract method, every subclass either is itself an abstract class, which you can have inheritance of abstract classes, or it better have an actual method and not an abstract method for these. In other words, I define that every piece of library material has some method or other of calculating the due date. Well, when I get around to actually defining the specific kinds of library materials, that is book, DVD, new book, new DVD, I better have written the actual functions that do the actual logic to determine the, 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 how long it's, you know, when it's due and, and how much the fine is. So if I have an abstract method, I cannot have a subclass that doesn't have an actual concrete method for that abstract method. So I can say, hey, library materials, there's no, I'm just going to say that all library materials have a get due date, and this is what it accepts, and this is what it returns, but I'm not going to give any logic at all, because there is no default logic. But then when I implement those, uh, that, in the subclasses, I have to have a real function for get due date and get fine. Now, any questions so far? If we scan through the requirements and we scan through these things, there better be a list of library materials in the patrons class. Because if I have to look and see how many are overdue, I need to look at the specific library material that's checked out. So I can't simply have a counter that I increment to say, well, this guy has two things out. This guy has three things out. Whoop, he returned one, now he only has two things out again. All right? I have to actually keep the library material that they checked out so I can look through and tell, okay, let's look at his first item. Is his first item overdue? No, it isn't. Is his second item overdue? No, it isn't. Is his third item overdue? No, it isn't. Is his fourth item overdue? Yes, it is. So, yes, the person has overdue library materials. This should look very familiar because this is similar to a student who has a list of classes or an order that has a list of pizzas. So it's going to work just about the same way. Just about the same way. In other words, when you check out a book, what's one of the things that checking out a book is going to do? It's going to put that book, or CD, or I'm sorry, DVD, or library material, it's going to take that and put it in the list of library materials for that person. So each person's going to have a list of the items that they've checked out. That's one of the things that it's going to do. Here's what I want you to think about for next time. All right? Because we're running out of time. And I'm going to look at what I think is the most important method here. Let me say a few things first before I look at, at the most important method. All right? The other, I mean, they're all important, right? But they're all top priority, but the top, top priority, you know. The one thing I have not indicated here, I have not indicated constructors. 
So you'd sort of want to decide what constructors you want for each class. And getting sets for the attributes. Right? For each attribute, you need a get and set method. So I didn't include those. That might be something that you would note in your class diagram. That I'll decide that later. And all attributes will have get and set methods and constructors TBD. That's probably acceptable that when you actually implement that, you look and see what constructors you want to create. All right. So we're going to look at the checkout method. There's going to be a method in the patron class to check out library material. All right. If you notice, according to the specifications, it should return a true if the book is checked out, a false if the book can't be checked out. So an item can't be checked out if a patron already has it, another patron already has it, or if a patron already has 10 items checked out, or if a patron has three or more overdue things. So there's rules. You can't just go check out as much stuff as you want. What I would like you to think about for this method is, number one, what's the signature for this method? And by signature, I mean, what's the name of the method? Well, that's pretty obvious. What arguments this method has? And then finally, what the return value is. Specifically, the type of value that it's going to return. Is it going to return a number? Is it going to return a string? It's going to return something else. Oops. Lastly, I would like you to write out, not code in Java, but I'd like to ask you to write out the steps it will take to check out a book or check out a, a, a piece of library material. Check out some library material. So write out, and it can be English language, you know, like first of all, see if book is checked out. If so, is already checked out. If so, then you do something. Otherwise, you do something else. All right. Then you might see how many books a person has out. If they have more than 10 out, then you do one thing. If they don't have less, if they have less than 10 out, you can do something else. And so on down the line. So I'd like you to write out, sometimes people call this pseudocode, or draw a flow chart, or just write notes that indicate step by step what you're going to do for the entire check out a book function. And I think if you got this one down, then the rest should be relatively straightforward. But the only thing tricky about the rest of this stuff is how to do data arithmetic. Like how to figure out like what is October 1st plus 23 days or something like that. There's functions to do it, but it is a little tricky. So think about this function for next time. All right. The good news is, is you already have an idea what the other functions in our classes are going to be, right? You know what classes are available, and you know what methods are available. So that should help you in deciding what needs to be put into this method. So we'll talk about this method on Wednesday. Any questions right now? All right. We'll see you up in lab.